number for that? 656. 656, thanks, sir. 656, we've got the church pipe. Mars already prayed, so that's good. She's really committed to the the Lord. So let's, let's read that. Mark 2, from 6 to 13. This is a response from people who are unhappy with Micah's negative prophecies. <laughs> Don't say such things that people respond. Don't prophesy like that. Such disasters will never come our way. Should you talk that way, O family of Israel, will the Lord's Spirit have patience with such behaviour? If you would do what is right, you would find my words comforting. Yet to this very hour my people rise against me like an enemy. You steal the shirts right off the backs of those who trusted you, making them as ragged as men returning from battle. You have evicted women from their pleasant homes and forever stripped their children of all that God would give them. Up, be gone. This is no longer your land and home, for you have filled it with sin and ruined it completely. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. Someday, O Israel, I'll gather you. I'll gather the remnant who are left. I'll bring you together again like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. Yes, your land will again be filled with noisy crowds. Your leader will break out and lead you out of exile, out through the gates of the enemy cities, back to your own land. Your king will lead you. The Lord himself will guide you. And in uh, Micah chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, this is what the Lord says, You false prophets are leading my people astray. You promise peace for those who give you food, but you declare war on those who refuse to feed you. Now the night will close around you, cutting off all your visions. Darkness will cover you, putting an end to your predictions. The sun will set for you, prophets, and your day will come to an end. Then your, you seers will be put to shame, and you fortune tellers will be disgraced and you will cover your faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord. I am filled with justice and strength to boldly declare Israel's sin and rebellion. So again, um, as we've been reading in my time, I'm just trying to find some common themes. It's like last week, it was the rich and the powerful oppressing the poor and the weak and the powerless. Today, it's false prophets, is the theme of the message. There was that little bit of hope in the middle, wasn't there? There's always a bit of hope interspersed with the, with the judgment of a restoration, a remnant, a rescue uh, uh, from God of his faithful people. And in general, this is, of course, a message of judgment. And the particular target today is false prophets. There's two main motives for false prophesying. People or purporting to speak on behalf of God, but not doing so. They're speaking lies, they're speaking nonsense. Popularity is one motive, and the other one is monetary gain. Those are the two main motives for a false prophet. It's the sort of prophet who's not so interested in P-R-O-P-H-E-T as in the other sort of prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. That's what they're in it for. That is their motivation. And throughout Israel's history, there's a long line of false prophets who come and go. And they basically are there to tell the king or the leadership of the nation whatever they want to do. That's their role, their self proclaimed role. And they do it, of course, for self. Because they will either not be killed by a particularly bloodthirsty king, or they will be given reward and popularity, and people will be pleased, and they will do very well out of it. So I'm going to give you a first example, I could be all day in this, but we'll just use a couple of examples. 1 Kings chapter 22, end of verse 10, we're talking about the time of King Ahab, a particularly wicked king, and it says this, all of Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, made some iron horns, and proclaimed, this is what the Lord says, with these horns you will gore the Arameans to death. Because the context is that Ahab is deciding whether to go into battle against the Arameans or not. And all the other prophets agreed, yes, they said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, 
for the Lord will give the king victory. Meanwhile, there's a man called Micaiah, who's a real prophet. And eventually, he says, actually, it's the opposite that's going to happen. And the response of Zedekiah in verse 24, instead of actually realising that he's on the wrong side of God, he says this, Then Zedekiah, son of Canaan, walked up to Micaiah and slapped him across the face. Since when did the Spirit of the Lord lead me to speak to you, he demanded. And Micaiah replied, You'll find out soon enough when you're trying to hide in some secret room. Ouch. Okay, so then we go Micah himself, there's all sorts of false prophets in his time, and then after Micah's time, we have a, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 28, and we're in the time of Zedekiah, not of course the old false prophet, but Zedekiah, the final king of Judah. They're nearing the end of the kingdom, they're about to be exiled. And this is what happens in Jeremiah 28 and verse 1. One day in late summer of that same year, the fourth year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Hananiah, son of Azur, a prophet from Gibeon, addressed me, we assume that means Jeremiah himself, addressed, addressed Jeremiah publicly in the temple, while all the priests and people listened. He said, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, I will remove the yoke of the king of Babylon from your necks. Within two years, I'll bring back all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar carried off to Babylon. And I'll bring back Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other captives that were taken to Babylon. I will surely break the, the yoke that the king of Babylon has put on your necks. I, the Lord, have spoken. So, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, but meanwhile, Jeremiah is wearing a wooden ox yoke around his neck to prove a point. The point, of course, being subjugation and slavery. And then, so verse 10. So Hananiah hasn't had enough. Hananiah, the prophet, took the yoke of Jeremiah's neck and broke it in pieces. And Hananiah said again to the crowd that had gathered, this is what the Lord says, just as this yoke has been broken, within two years I'll break the yoke of oppression from all the nations now subject to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. With that, Jeremiah left the temple area. Soon after this confrontation with Hananiah, the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. Go and tell Hananiah, this is what the Lord says. You have broken a wooden yoke, but you have replaced it with the yoke of iron. The Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says, I have put a yoke of iron on the necks of all these nations, forcing them into slavery under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. I have put everything, even the wild animals, under his control. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you that the people believe your lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, you must die. Your life reign is for a year because you have rebelled against the Lord. Two months later, the prophet Hananiah died. And that continues. It continues in the New Testament. There's all sorts of people speaking nonsense or speaking for personal gain or speaking false gospels. It's warned against by Paul and James and John and Peter and other of the apostles. Jesus warns of it indirectly as well. And even today, we have the same. People peddling a false gospel, or even using the real gospel, but using it for their own personal financial gains. You've got the sort of things where you have some preachers who ask for money so that they can proclaim blessings. You know, if you give money to my ministry, then you'll be blessed, because you're honouring God, but I actually probably honour your person. <laughs> but you, know, you see where it still comes in, and again, it's the desire for popularity, the desire for control, the desire for power, and for money. And it still continues. But three things I'll say about this. First thing is this. <clears throat> the, when, you, when, when, when anyone, particularly someone with an actual gift of prophecy, that, that makes it much more serious. But when anyone says something like this, God says this, and they know it's from God, or even worse, it's actually contrary to the gospel, to, oh, sorry, to the Bible, and to God's character. When someone does that, they are breaking commandment number three. Basically, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, taking the Lord's name in vain is saying, oh my God. Well, that's a stupid statement. Anyway, that, that, that's what we think of. It's saying things like God says, either to manipulate someone, 
or just pure sort of delusion. There could be all sorts of motivations for it. You must be very careful not to say a God what he hasn't said. He doesn't take comment to it. And in its worst form, it's actually blasphemy, which is, of course, incredibly serious. That's the first thing to say about it. The second thing to say about these false prophets is that while they're very popular, while they're saying what the king and the people want to hear, they don't have the king and the people's best interests at heart. It's about themselves, purely. And we can see that from those two examples I gave. With Ahab, Zedekiah and the other prophets prophesy to him what he wants to hear. But they're sending him to his death. Because Ahab would die in that battle. So do you think they're doing it because they love like Ahab? No, they're doing it because they know he will reward them for it. Because they're then massaging his ego. He's a very proud man. Likewise, with this chap Hananiah about Zedekiah. When Zedekiah was looking, I felt a bit sorry for Zedekiah. You'll see from me in my book that I feel a bit sorry for him because he basically had no chance. Israel was finished by the time he became the king. They were going into exile, whatever. And Zedekiah's job was to actually graciously and humbly go with as little suffering to his people as possible. But for Zedekiah, even though he's a wicked man, he thought that God would still bless him in his nation. And people like Hananiah egged him on in this. So that instead of actually just saying, okay, we're going to go, we know our time's up, we're going to go peacefully, they actually persuaded him to resist. And there was a horrendous siege in Jerusalem which caused untold suffering. And the prophets like Hananiah are complicit in that because they actually were <coughs> encouraging Zedekiah to continue to rebel against what must happen. So you think that they're listening to heart now. Whereas Micaiah and Micah and Jeremiah, as much as they said quite nasty things, actually they were saying a message of love. It was a hard message. But when they, if the people would listen to them, it would be far better from them. So that's the second thing to say. That, that message might seem flattering, it might seem nice, it might seem pleasant, it might seem loving, but it's actually not going to do very good. It's not in their interest. The third thing is, God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. And you know that there will be harsh traps in the bottom of people. Harsh traps. And we see a, a little bit of a hint of that with Zedekiah. What happened in that secret room, you imagine he met his enemies quite quickly. With Hananiah, um, he was, he of course, died within two months. There will be a judgment on these people, and sadly, there will be an eternal judgment on them as well. Because of their ashes. scary thing. It's also very important to say that as Luke 12, 48 reminds us, um, Jesus says, but someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Likewise, in James 3, verse 1, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that applies even more, I believe, to prophets. So you've been given this gift from God. You've been given words from God, potentially. Some of these prophets who became false prophets possibly were even spoken to by God and given his gift, which they then misused in a horrendous way. Now we judge severely for this. They're actually going against what God has given them and talking nonsense just for their own self-benefit. But what's interesting to note here is that if someone is given a gift, a spiritual gift, and then they misuse it in such a way, God won't, God won't um, continue to give them it. In the end, they won't hear from God at all. He will take it away. And we get a hint of that in Micah chapter 3. First of all, he says to the leaders, of Israel who think that they're still right before God even though they're mistreating everyone. This is verse 4. You beg the Lord for help in times of trouble. Do you really expect him to answer? After all the evil you have done, he won't even look at you. And then verse 7. Then you seers will be put to shame, you fortune tellers will be disgraced, and you will cover your faces because there is no answer from God. God will take that gift away. And actually, isn't it true 
that when God's biggest judgment isn't when we suffer or are somehow punished for our sins, it's when God is silent, when he turns his face off. We said literally that of Christ. That's what God's, not Christ's fault, he said now it's not himself. But that's the biggest punishment, the Father turns his face off. And if you've ever felt that in your life, that you try to pray and there's no answer, nothing, then you know you've been in the wrong path, in that place. You've been going down the wrong track and think, I actually need to change my, my path there, I need to change my position, this isn't, this is, I can't live like this. That's harsh trouble, it's the when things go wrong, you feel almost God's hand upon you. It's when he's hands you upon you. It's more dangerous in the extreme. So we, we need to, we beware misusing God's gifts and misappropriating God's name. Well, the wonderful thing, though, is this, that God can even use those who are demonic. In, 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 um, in Micah chapter 6, verse 5, he alludes to Balaam, the son of Balak. Uh, sorry, the back to Balaam, Balaam, who was told by Balak to go and curse the Israelites. You know, Balaam was basically demonic. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was, uh, he had a gift of prophecy, but it wasn't from God. He was a soothsayer from somewhere else. You know, God is in control even of that. And so when he was asked to curse God's people, the Israelites, he blessed them. Do you think Balaam wants to bless the Israelites? One, he's going to miss up the big payday. And two, we know that Balaam was against the Israelites because you know what he did after that? When he couldn't curse them, he tempted them. The Bible actually tells you actually tempted them quite successful in that. But Balaam, when he tried to curse them, in spite of himself, blessings came out. God can overrule even the most wicked of things and even the most dangerous of false preachers. And we must always be comforted with that thought, but we must still very much be on our guard. Because it's a massive temptation for all of us to put personal profit above godliness or truth. And there's a tendency today and this is it, he speaks to church leaders, uh, church, Christian agencies, charities, evangelists, uh, people with healing ministries, etc., prophecies, etc. The tendency towards the public relations, the impressive targets, and the results based sort of work to impress people. Especially those who are writing prayer letters and other reports. You know, you make sure everything gets embellished to make it look really good. And then more people might support the ministry. Very, very tempting to do. And sadly, it happens a lot. Very tempting. And I think it's very tempting for everyone when it comes to CVs and, and resumes, isn't it? All these perfect employees suddenly appear. Wow, it's amazing. Really? Mm, not sure about that. We, yeah, we all know about that one. But it's very tempting. And I, I'm tempting this myself, big time. You, know, you meet other pastors, you know, well, my, in my, my church, which isn't anyway, it's not his church. Yeah. Everything's amazing. And everyone starts always on this sort of thing, sort of contest of who's got the most amazing ministry. Very easy to get into that, to be tempted to do that, and to not and tell anyone that things sometimes are difficult. Because that's doesn't impress people. Your reputation doesn't go up as much. You may not get invited to speak at things, etc., etc., if you actually tell the truth rather than embellish things and make it look like you're going to make very, very tempting to do it, indeed. And I think one of the biggest temptations is for evangelists to do this. Because evangelists, and I know this side actually trained as an evangelist and worked as one, well. with evangelists you've got this whole thing with, you know, your, your, your ministry is based on how many people come to faith in Christ, isn't it? Basically, that's because that's your specific calling to be involved in that. And so, therefore, when you write your letters and you, you look for support from people and your reputation, the temptation is that I brought people to Christ. And actually, they rubbish. Because people come to Christ because God draws them to himself and they respond to him. It's a mixture, I believe, of his sovereignty and people's free will, ultimately. Not other people. But, of course, God uses us, all of us, as witnesses, but specifically evangelists, to be involved in that. But they don't save people. No evangelist has ever saved anyone. They're involved in it if they're faithful to God. But the temptation is to say, well, I made 20 people pray the sinner's prayer today, and they're all saved. Now, we must be very careful of mocking the word of the Holy Spirit. But let's see the fruit. Where are they now? What's happened now? What happened after? Oh, yeah, but they were saved. They were prayed the prayer. Yeah, but what happened now? Where are they? 
Did they just practically put pressure on them? Was it just an emotional decision? Or what, how were they being discipled? But, but that really looks better, doesn't it? It's like the big spectacular missions where you know, 30, 40, 100 of people make, you know, put their hand up. Or oh, it looks good. Again, what happens to them? You know, I don't think we ever see anything. But what happens? I, I was on um, a number of years ago, I was involved in a, a Christian youth mission. Uh, for, for children and young people, and I was in the teenage group. And one evening, 20 kids, when they asked, they did an altar call, so it's not like 20 of the teenagers put their hands up, most of the people there, I think it was, to, to, to um, ask Jesus into their lives. So the sinner's prayer was saved, which is right, nothing wrong with any of that being done. And then they were like, right, we're going to tell everyone that, you know, in, in, in the rest of the mission, that we had 20 people saved last night. <laughs> but I want people to be saved as much as any of those other guys. No, don't, don't get me wrong. And I hate being the cynical one. And I said, but did they really make that camera? I tell you what, I got in trouble for it. I said, but no, was it real? How did you know they haven't really committed it before? Well, they were the first time immigrants. And did some of them, you know what teenagers are like, sorry, no offense to teenagers. But, but they, if, if, if all their friends are doing it, they're going to put their hand as well. You know, so there's a bit of a, uh, uh, what do you peer mentality here, herd mentality. So is that real? And what happens when they leave here? Are they really going to go on with the Lord? Now, I don't want to doubt that. And I feel bad. So, and I tell you, the guy that led it wasn't happy. I really used to doubt that. And he said, I know. But, but of course, it looks good. Very tempting. And again, that's misappropriating the work of God potentially. We need to be involved in the bigger picture, the long haul, which isn't so cool, is it? It's not so spectacular. But that's the real life change lives that we need to see, not just a one off commitment, which you don't know how long it's going to last for. So three things I want us to think about now on this one is firstly, and it was reiterated a little bit, James chapter two from last week. Do you remember the passage where the rich man and the poor man come into church and they're treated very differently? Remember that from last week? We do need to think about how we are to different people. Is it because it's easy to flatter those who can benefit us, isn't it? It's easy to treat people in different ways. Because some people can do good for us, or, or can, can be very helpful or strategic, and others might be more hard work for various reasons. And so when people even come in church, we might think, oh, true. We may not think that, it might start unconsciously happen. So the person who looks rich and uh, influential with gifts, etc., etc., I, I've done this before and I'll put my hand up. I'm sure I've made more effort than I can I say that for me personally? Because it's tempting to say, oh yeah, there might be more money for the church, there might be more gift to the church. We might help with leadership, we might help with all these things. And then when it's the person who might be more difficult, the person who may be an alcoholic or homeless or, or whatever, or, or, or English isn't their first language and they're, they're still struggling with it, uh, and that's that from guys that way, they may not try as hard. You know, are, we, are we equal in how we treat people? Are we looking to flatter the influential? Because that, of course, is one of the main things these prophets are doing, isn't it? Micah chapter 3, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. You false prophets are leading my people astray. You promise peace for those who give you food, but you declare war on those who refuse to feed you. So you think the rich are going to do well out of these prophets, aren't they? Really well. Because, you know, they're giving them what they want. There's those who are cynical about it those you can't afford to pay them. Or are they going to be ignored or they're going to be cursed? And I know it doesn't happen so much in this country, but I know there's plenty of places around the world, and especially in history, where you get on the wrong side of the local suit and they'll curse you. And there could be some sort of spiritual power in these curses. So you've got to be really careful of that, not to get on their wrong side. But then again, you don't want to um, encourage their wickedness. That's quite a hard situation a lot of people would find themselves in. But it's Again, it's tempting to treat people differently, depending on their feeling to us. Who can deny that so, because they might get a straight like that later? Big temptation for us all. Especially church leaders, can I say. And then, second one. Uh, how are we with how we speak the truth of the gospel to people? How are we? I don't just mean when we tell people the good news. That's great. I'm talking about those words of challenge that Micah had to give the people of Israel, for example. Because, again, Micah's challenge was far more loving than the non-challenge of the false prophets. 
Isn't it easy when we see someone, a friend or whoever, going astray, doing something wrong, to say nothing? We might say, oh, because I love them, I wouldn't judge them. That, that's our excuse, isn't it? But, isn't it better if someone's going down the wrong road just to sort of help target them back? And I know there's amazing means of doing this. You really love sensitivity and, uh, of course, non-hypocrisy are quite important in these days. But isn't it more loving to actually want someone? Yeah. Even if it risks friendship? Mm-hmm. Even if the person decides to shoot the messenger? <laughs> um, because even if that happens, you never know, they might have been challenged. Mm-hmm. But are you willing to risk a friendship for the good of someone? Mm-hmm. Out of them, by saying that harsh word. Social media, or whatever, it always seems to be saying that. Oh, yeah, if you like it, you did it. I don't know. Again, we've got to be sensitive, loving, and non, non, non hypocritical, but it's an important thing to do. And that's real love. It's hard love, it's tough love. It's risky love, but it is real love, not like pretend love, which is actually shallow. Third thing, we need to be careful about who we and how we listen to people. Big time. This is probably the biggest take out of this message. Not just because we need to be guarding our souls, our own souls, but also to be guarding other people's. That specifically applies to me as a pastor and anyone who's an elder, because obviously that under shepherd work, you've got people who look for the responsibility. But I think we should all, to a certain extent, be responsible for others. Our friends and those maybe in our small groups, in our ministry team, or just those that we, we know who maybe look up to us as maybe more mature Christians. There's always people who should be looking to God. Teaching from the guy away, from the wolves in sheep's clothing, as it were. How are we? Are we careful with what we consume? Whether it's from the front, actually, you need to judge what I say. You need to weigh what I say. Because if I'm talking nonsense, one, you need to not listen to it, two, you need to challenge me. Mm-hmm. So it applies to everyone. I can't speak of anyone, everyone else, and not challenge myself for this. But what about what we're looking at on social media, YouTube, uh, the books we read, uh, TV, films? Blogs. Are we going to be careful with what we allow ourselves to consume? Or are we not careful? And sometimes, can I say this? When I, I, I'm on, obviously on Facebook and some, of, some people here are my friends on Facebook, which I know is a strange thing, friends on Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's often a misnomer, isn't it? But anyway, um, and I, occasionally I have taken people up on it because I've seen them, them looking at some these sort of teachers that I think are way offline. And so you're probably all one on friend me now from Facebook if you got me on. But I would do that because I'm not trying to help the, the good of the person. Not because I'm trying to judge them or because I think I'm a big time the only right teacher like that if that comes across like a good person. But we do need to guard one another. And we're going to guard ourselves first of all. Because it's a dangerous teaching out there. And I want to say there's two types of false teachers. Two types. One is the, is, the, is the teacher who basically preaches the gospel, okay? But they're doing it for their own interests. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 1, when he says this. Verse 15 onwards. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives. They preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my claims more painful to me. But that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. These are the preachers who I believe people can be saved through. But I tell you what, I'm not certain they're saved. And that was that's to God with me. <laughs> God. Um, but you know, there are some preachers, and it's all about them. And they're getting very rich, very powerful, lots of control, very, and they look like they're far from God, you know. But I believe that people who are genuinely seeking God are saved in the ministry. And I honestly say that. So I warn of it getting into the involved in their ministry, but I also acknowledge, like Paul, that there are those who they may end up missing out at the end. But 
a lot of people will be saved almost in spite of them because they have basically preached the good news. But then you've got the other false teacher. And the other false teacher is someone who's actually preaching a false gospel completely. Complete false gospel. And that is the most dangerous, of course, because they really will stop people coming to heaven. They'll stop people coming into God's presence. It's the, it's the, it's the cult or the sect. It's something like the Jehovah's Witnesses and others who deny Christ entirely. And we need to be very, very careful of anything that denies Christ and actually takes people away from the possibility of actual salvation in Christ alone. In 2 John it says this. Great little book here, hidden at the end of the Bible, 2 John. In verse 7. I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God, but anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people becomes a partner in their evil work. That's very harsh teaching, isn't it? Really harsh. It looks tough to me. But again, John, as a, an apostle of Christ, is trying to look out for his sheep entrusted to his care. You know, if there are those who are blatantly going to turn people away from the path, you need to avoid them. You've got to avoid them, because they will turn you away. The wolves and sheep turn. We must be very careful. We must be willing to warn our brothers and sisters where there is dangerous teaching and also the first of all God our own saves. And remember this. It's not about popularity. It's not about money. It's not about prestige. It's not about what looks spectacular. It's what's the real truth of the gospel and the real heart of the person. They grow up on God. They grow up on themselves. It's what we always need as well. I'll just leave you with two examples of real prophets who were popular at all. But that actually possibly means they're more likely to be right before God. But sadly, it's the remnant who choose for God and who eventually will be rescued as we get that hint at the end of Micah 2. So my, I'll give you the bad example first. Micah 2, 11. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. That's nice, I can do as much as I want. It's fantastic, isn't that good? And of course people want to hear that. Because what does 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 say? We cannot leave without this coming. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itchy ears want 